Hi everyone, Michael Cavaccini here, and today I'm delighted to have the opportunity to interview Bev Benson. He is the author of the brand new book, Stephen King, A Complete Exploration of His Work, Life, and Influences. Uh, this book just came out. As you can see, I have a copy right here. Um, and uh, Bev has written about a half a dozen books over his nearly 25 years as a writer, just a really gifted writer, uh, friends of Stephen King, and um, this uh, release is very exciting because it coincides with uh, Stephen King's, I believe is it his 70th or 75th birthday? 75th. 75, wow, how about that? Well, thank you for joining me, I really do appreciate it. Thanks for having me on, appreciate you having me here. Yeah, so I mean, how about that? So 75, something I've really noticed lately is um, the writers who I really admire, uh, one of them being Stephen King, the other, Clive Barker is another one of them. And so Clive is turning uh, 70, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, right. this month. And then Stephen King is now 75. Uh, and these guys were still active, still creative, still, you know, just inspiring us. And it's, it's interesting because uh, Clive Barker is executive producing the new Hellraiser movie, which is coming out, I think, just in a few days on Hulu. Mm -hmm. Stephen King obviously has his great new novel out, Fairy Tale, which I'm currently listening to on Audible. And, you know, these guys are just like, they're still, I love that even at, in their 70s, they're just this, these unstoppable creative forces. And I've always said that Stephen King to me is an inspiration for that reason. Like I, I, I like to joke around and say he could have been the Billy Joel of authors and stopped <laughs> in the 90s. But instead, he said, no, I'm going to keep creating. I'm going to create multiple genres. I'm not just going to be that horror guy and just say, oh, yeah, I remember back when um and i just think that that's fantastic so i mean bev you know why do you think he you know what is it that just keeps him going and wants him to continue to create i don't think he has any choice i i think he's always got stories percolating in his mind now i saw an interview with him that he recently did with a, a french literary uh, uh news magazine and he talks about how when he goes to bed at night he has this he was very specific, something like this, 14 minutes, or something like that, before he goes to sleep, when he is building up and adding to and developing whatever he's going to be working on now or whatever is going to be coming next. I just think that stories flood into him, uh, and I don't think there's any way to turn that tap off. Thankfully, uh, there's no way to turn that off. Yeah, it's and I, I feel the same way. I mean, not that I'm at the level of Stephen King, but I feel like if you're a creative person, you you just want to create. And when you're around other creative people, uh, you want to create more. Like I have attended Thriller Fest several times in New York, uh, this writer's conference and Lee Child's there and Anne Rice is there, George R. R. Martin and all these other amazing writers, Stephen James, who I think is uh, wonderful. And when you hear them talk about the creative process and what they do and how they do it and, um, <laughs> there's even one guy dp lyle who talks about the the, the the most medically accurate way to kill someone and here are the different <laughs> ways you can like poison them like this and use this gun or use it it's like, it's like what a weird community but i think when you're around other creative people it just um you kind of feed off of one another Do you, would you agree with that i would and you know king has the added benefit of he lives in a family of writers his wife is a novelist and poet his oldest son has written numerous novels and graphic novels. Um, he has collaborated with his younger son, Owen, on a novel, and Owen has other books in his own. So you know, I, I, they've talked about the tradition of sitting around the table, having dinner, sharing stories with each other, making up stories on the spot. So that creativity has always been around him. Yeah, yeah. And I think some people think, uh, well, some people say, oh, I hate writing, or I'm not good at writing. And I think at the heart of it is what you were just saying, storytelling. And then we all tell stories one way or another, right? Whether you're, um, you know, Art Garfunkel or you're just a guy telling a story at the bar. I mean, everyone's telling a story in some form or fashion. Uh, and I've, something I found really interesting is that sometimes some of the most successful writers actually aren't that great at writing. I mean, I've communicated with them through email and things like that. And I've been like, wow, what the hell is this? <laughs> and then I realized, oh, they must have really great editors or, you know, like they're great storytellers at heart, but maybe they're not great when it comes to grammar, um, which I find kind of fascinating because I'm like, this person's been like on the top of the bestsellers list. How is this possible? But I think we just... all have our pet words that we always misspell. 
Um, <laughs> I've seen numerous writers, you know, best-selling writers say, for the life of me, I don't know how to spell the word sheriff. Or, uh, and yeah, we've all got our little, and, and you can tell if you look at uh, like uh, unpublished manuscripts, you can look through them, you can see there's those words that keep showing up that aren't spelled correctly. And it's just a, it's just a tick that we all have, I think. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but to that point, you know, do you think it's important to get caught up in that? Or do you think when you're writing that first draft of whatever it is, should you really just kind of push through and just try to get that story down and like, you know, revisions are where you really kind of take care of the polishing things. I think it depends on your writing style. There are certain writers who edit so extensively as they go that by the time they get to the end of the what we would normally think of as the first draft, they've got a highly polished manuscript, which only needs sort of a gloss. Um, other writers, I think, are more like what you're describing is, you know, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. Uh, let's just get this thing down and we'll figure out what it's about and how to fix it when we're finished. Um, and there's hybrid of that, you know, I'm the sort of writer, if I get to a certain point and I need to look something up, I will stop and go do the research. Whereas King has said he needs to finish it so he needs, so he can then figure out what he needs to research. Um, for example, from a Buick 8, which takes place in uh, the Philadelphia sort of state police, when he was finished with the first draft of that, he knew there were certain things he needed to find out. And so he went on a, a research trip to uh, the Pennsylvania State Police and, you know, very specific questions he would ask. And he didn't need to know absolutely everything. He just needed to know enough to be able to lie convincingly. Absolutely. Uh, one of my favorite, and it's funny, I've never read that uh, story, but I'm going to have to because I, I'm in Philadelphia. Um, but Harlan Coben is one of my favorite writers. I think he's just fantastic. And I can tell when I'm actually uh, reading his books when he doesn't necessarily know a lot about something. Like he'll just kind of reference it. And then I'll even have the characters sometimes say, yeah, I don't really know. Because he doesn't know. And I can yeah. tell that he wrote it that way to be kind of comical, but to also acknowledge the fact that, yeah, this is about as much as I know about that. But he does it in a way where it works with the dialogue and the story. So like, you don't have to come off as an expert on every single topic that pops up throughout the book. It's just if you want to have like an interesting aside or tidbit, you can toss it in there. Um, so I, I just find it uh, you know, interesting when you bring that up. Uh, so, yeah, with your book, you know, Stephen King, a complete exploration of his work, life and influences, uh, you know, for people who don't know you uh, and might ask, well, who are you? Who, how are you qualified to write this book about such an important guy at, at such a pivotal milestone in his life? You know, what, you know, what, what do you think? Because um, this is you know, a big undertaking at a big moment in his life. So, I mean, is this something you came up with or, or were you, like, how did this come about? And, you know, kind of what's your Stephen King credentials? So the, the, there's a long road to get to this point and I, I can pretty much trace it out. Um, so in the 1990s, the internet started up, people who were fans of certain things all started getting together or in parts of the internet talking about stuff, and I was very active there. And because of my activity, Richard Chismar, who's the publisher of Cemetery Dance Magazine, said, you know, how would you like to write a column for my magazine? Every issue we do on a Stephen King news and reviews and commentary. And this was about 2001. And I thought, well, sure, you know, why not? You know, it's... I'm sort of doing this uh, in an amateur sense on these uh, news groups anyway. So, you know, why not sort of quantify it and, you know, get it on paper. And so after that had been going for a while, uh, people started asking me, you know, when was I going to write a book about Stephen King? And th that gave me pause. And I was thinking, wow, that's a big, big ask. That's a big task. Because even in 2003 or so, he had, pretty impressive catalog. Um, but the idea that came to me first was to write about his Dark Tower series, because this was something that had spanned his writing career up to that point. He started working on when he was 21. He was finishing it up in 2004. And I thought, now here's something manageable. It's seven books that I can sort of analyze and write about. And it has connections to just about everything else he's ever written. 
So it seemed like an interesting project. And on the strength of my cemetery dance columns, I was able to get a publisher to agree to publish that book, um, especially since King had agreed to give me the manuscripts to the last three books two years before they were published, which was just an incredible uh, you know, gesture of uh, trust. Um, and so Road to the Dark Tower came out in 03, 04, thereabouts. And um, I continued to write the the news from the dead zone column for cemetery dance so i've got this filing cabinet that's full of interviews and you know columns and essays and all that so i've got all of this data that i've collected over you know even longer than 20 years and so the the first step in this process that led to this book then was barnes and noble got in touch with a uh, publisher called becker and meyer and asked them to create a Stephen King reader's companion and they had been doing some of these on other authors they had one on Poe and they had one on Jane Austen and the really cool thing about them was that they had all of this removable media you know when you opened the book there were these little envelopes and you take out something that was um, a really literal reproduction of something historical um, the front page in the New York Times when Poe died or you know some napkin that Jane Austen had scribbled on or something like that so they were really tactile books but it was a limited scope. Um, you know, I had a very limited word count, very short time to produce this book. And so I could only focus on eight or 10 books. And I really wanted to focus on the ones that had a significant biographical aspect to them. Something in King's life led to this book or something interesting in King's life was happening when he was working on this book. Um, and so that became the Stephen King Illustrated Companion, which you can see over my left shoulder here. And so I, I did an update to that book a few years later, and then I went back to them last year and I said, you know, what do you think about doing another update? And they said, well, rather than do an update, let's do it just like a massively expanded one that covers everything. What, you know, what justification would we have for doing this book now? And so I said, well, you know, 2022, he's going to be 75. That's a pretty significant, uh, you know, milestone. And so that was what the editor needed to sell the project internally. To say, ah, oh, yes, you know, we can do this, and there's a reason for doing it. And so that's that's my story of how I ended up working on this uh, this book, which came out uh, in the middle of last month. Yeah, that's exciting. So you mentioned that you've developed a relationship with Stephen King. Um, you know, I, interviewing people, uh, you know, I've had the, the good fortune of interviewing authors as well as musicians. Um, you know, it's just pretty incredible when you can connect with people on that level. Uh, and it's not really about name dropping, right? It's about just saying, hey, uh, this person sees me as their friend and we're connected, we're peers. Um, there's something just really delightful about that. And obviously you got to that point with Stephen King, who I consider to be the greatest writer alive. Um, I just think he's just a you know, just boundless talent. So how did that come about? And what did that mean to you? Were you I mean, do you still kind of pinch yourself and say, holy hell, I'm friends with Stephen King. How did that happen? <laughs> so again, this go, dates back to the 1990s. Um, in the, the news groups that, uh, that we were posting on at the time, and they were very active. There was all sorts of people, you know, writing about, you know, the, the latest book or whatever. One of the people who was semi-lurking, but not, you know, posting a little bit was Tabitha King. And she was doing it under a pseudonym, but there were a few things that sort of keyed me in that I guessed who it was. And we developed a pen pal relationship at that time. We write back and forth, mostly about family, because I had a very young family and she had a little bit older family. And we talked about, you know, you know how you get through certain phases and raising kids and things like that. And all, mostly it was all just, you know, like a pen pal, just a friend. And so there was one time when my wife and I were traveling back to visit my family. And I grew up in New Brunswick in eastern Canada. And <laughs> the geographical people, New Brunswick shares a border with Maine. And Bangor was a place that I used to go to a lot when I was a kid because it was close. You know, we'd go across into the United States for camping trips and that. And But it was also convenient to fly in there to drive the rest of the trip up to visit my parents. And so I, I just said, you know, passing, we're going to be in Bangor on this day. It'd be cool if we could get together and, you know, have coffee or something like that and actually meet. And it turned out that she invited us to come to the house for the evening. 
And so oh. we we spent the evening uh, mostly talking with her, but Steve came in and we you know we had our time with him and his his sons were around. So that was a, a pretty cool experience. And then um, when I started writing the cemetery dance column, actually before I started writing it, I I wrote to him via the office and I said, you know, Rich has asked me to do this. If you think it's a terrible idea, you know, I'll just you know I'll step aside. But uh, I, but he wrote back and said no. He said yeah, go ahead and do it. Over the years, we've developed a, uh, a friendship, you know, of email friendship, where mostly we uh, recommend books and uh, TV series and things like that to each other because we're interested in the same sorts of things, um, European uh, horror or European uh, crime series and things like that. So that, that's sort of an ongoing dialogue with us. Um, and I've met him a number of times in person over the years at different events. Um, one of which led to us uh, collaborating on this anthology called Flight or Fright, um, which we did uh, three or four years ago now. Yeah. And what was that like? I mean, being able to collaborate with him and what was the process uh, for bringing that book uh, to life? Well, we, we met at a restaurant um, before the um, world premiere of the Dark Tower movie. And he'd invited a lot of people to come in for that. And so there were people from the, the film company and the people who'd worked on it. And his research was there. And Richard Schismar was there with his sons. And so we were all gathered together. And everybody had had a little uh, interesting travel uh, story to tell because, you know, getting to Bangor is not always that easy. You end up on puddle jumpers and things like that. And as he worked the room, he, and he had just read... Um, the Horror of the Heights by H.G. Um, Wells. Uh, no, sorry, um, Sherlock Holmes author. And um, it just came to him that he said, we should get together all of the uh, short stories that have been published that deal with things that go bad when flying. And so he pitched the idea to Richard Chismar, who ran a publisher, uh, publishing company and he you know, said Rich will publish it and they said but I'll need some help finding the stories and he, he said you know you can help me with that and so after that um, that dinner and after the movie and all that I came back to Texas and I was thinking you know was he serious or was that just something he tossed off I'm going to behave as if he was completely serious and I'm going to start digging around and we started sending things back and forth to each other you know ideas uh, stories that we found um, I put out a pitch on Facebook and other social media for people to give us suggestions of stories. And so we started assembling this manuscript. And the original idea was that we were going to republish the Langoliers um, because the concept of the anthology was, you know, it wasn't going to be new material. It was all going to be uh, reprints. But the Langoliers is a, a really long story. We think of it as a novella, but it's 100,000 words. It's as wow. long as most novels are. And it really disproportionately would have taken up a big chunk of the book. And so he said, well, you know, what, uh, what do you think if I write a new story for it? And I'm thinking, oh, no, Steve, please don't write something new. That won't help the anthology at all. <laughs> and so he did. He came up with a story called The Turbulence Expert. And then he was talking about this anthology with his son, Joe, Joe, Joe Hill. Um, and Joe had an idea, and so we ended up having the two stories, um, Joe's story, You Shall Be Released, and, and Steve's story, and the rest of them are reprints, but, and then he wrote the, uh, the little intros to each of the stories, um, I, and he'd send them off to me, and I sort of assembled the manuscript, and I remember there was one time, I think he was working on the Roald Dahl story, and his power went out, and so he sat there and he wrote the introduction to it longhand and he took a snapshot of it and uh, sent me the, the photograph of the introduction. So, you know, he was clearly very excited by this uh, anthology. And the, the introduction that he wrote for it is just fantastic. I think the scariest story in the uh, collection is the, the real life story that he tells in the introduction to that anthology about a, a near miss he had while flying. Wow. Yeah. I hope his handwriting was illegible. I don't know if I wrote it by hand, you would not know what I wrote. <laughs> his handwriting is immaculate. It's a kind of print writing that um, has sort of become famous over the years because he has done things that have been released as promotional material. So uh, Dreamcatcher, for example, he wrote Dreamcatcher completely by hand um, because this wow. was immediately after his accident and he couldn't sit at the computer for any length of time. So he wrote in these ledgers 
And when the book was published, Scribner released a facsimile of like eight pages. And yeah, it's 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 really almost more printing than writing, but it's sort of a hybrid, very, very readable. Mm. Um, so a couple of things I want to explore here. One is rage. So I remember reading years ago that he uh, took that out of print because of school shootings, right? Because there was, I guess, multiple news accounts where uh, school shootings took place and uh, the kids who may have you know, committed these shootings had read the book. You know, and I guess he thought maybe it would help. I mean, but here we are now and the, God, it seems like school shootings are, and mass shootings just in general are just uh, worse than ever. Um, and, you know, Stephen King is a pretty liberal guy, uh, and I really do identify with his politics. And um, so, I mean, knowing that and knowing how there's all this, like, you know, banned books and censorship and all this stuff now because of, you know, people. Do you think his opinion on that has changed? And he has said, well, you know, it really didn't help, you know, not having it in print. And do you think he'd ever reconsider putting it back into print because really politics are the, the, what's to blame for the most part and poor laws for, for guns, uh, for, for mass shootings and school shootings, not necessarily arts and culture. Uh, I'm not sure if, if you guys have ever discussed that or not, or just your own opinion, but you know, do you think his opinion about that has changed considering everything that's played out since then? This is my opinion. Uh, we've not discussed it. My feeling is that he would see no benefit in bringing it back into print again. Um, one of the things he talked about was how many times he had been interviewed by the FBI in the aftermath of some of these earlier school shootings, which probably wasn't a terribly fun thing to have to do. Um, it's also a, a very early work. Uh, he started writing it when he was 16. Um, he finished, uh, you know, rewriting it when he was in college. And so it's, you know, it's not as polished as some of his more recent work. Um, he has other books that he's written that he's never had published at all. And so I think he would probably lump this into the, uh, the category of, you know, it had its run. It caused a lot of problems. Um, bringing it back isn't going to solve those problems. And if, if it ended up being once more an inspiration, then that would, you know, he just doesn't want that on his conscience, I think I would say. Right. Yeah, that's fair enough. Um, I mean, you see his other unpublished books just because he feels that those are what earlier works that just aren't up to stuff. Yeah, yeah. there's one that he wrote in college um, right after he finished working on uh, The Long Walk. And he, he workshopped it with one of his faculty advisors. Uh, it was called Sword in the Darkness. And the faculty yeah. advisor had told him to try to write something that was topical. And so it had to do with race riots and the turbulence of the 70s. And it's a really long book, um, but it's probably so much of its era that it wouldn't necessarily connect anymore with, you know, we're talking 50 years later. Uh, so it, it's in his archives. Um, researchers have read it. There's a synopsis, a very detailed synopsis of it in one of Rocky Woods' books. But yeah, that, that, that'll never get published, I'm sure. That's interesting. And, and do you think, uh, so you don't think it's going to be like a, a Michael Jackson or Prince thing where when he passes away in the future, they're going <laughs> to publish these uh, unpublished works? Uh, well, you know, he, he's had his stab at what that scenario might look like in a book called Lisey's Story. And mm -hmm. in Lisey's Story, he has this character, he calls him an unkunk. Basically, it's somebody who's such a rabid fan that he... Once this famous author dies, he just just salivating to get his hands on anything and everything that are in his archives or his library or his papers, and the his his the the writer's wife, his widow, is the person who's put in the position of having to be the gatekeeper for all of this work, because there's lots of things that, you know, I think. I mean, one of the worst things I ever heard about happening was when Douglas Adam died, you know, the guy who wrote uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. They yeah. found all this stuff on his hard drive, and they just started piecemealing it together. And some of it was incomplete, and, you know, they published incomplete fragments, and it's just like pillaging, to my mind. Um, and Neil Gaiman has gone on the record to say that 
something authors need to have is a literary executor, somebody who will be the person who then decides what happens to both your published works. And, you know, if, if people wanted to reprint a short story, for example, somebody has to be able to sign off on that, but also be the gatekeeper for your unpublished work to say, there's stuff that probably doesn't merit being published and somebody needs to watch over that. Yeah, that, that is a very interesting thing to consider. Uh, and, and yeah, I think it matters because obviously they should have a say in what their legacy is and they don't want that to be altered mm -hmm. in the future just by people trying to make a buck mm -hmm. off of it. Um, so yeah, very interesting. And I, out of curiosity, and then we're going to get into your book, um, but I'm just curious. I remember reading recently about Stephen King opening up his house uh, for like a writer's retreat because um, people go there almost like it's like Graceland or um, it's a destination, right? That people will, which I'm sure can be a little annoying um, for him. But then he came up with this idea to have like this writer's retreat, which I mean, talk about the ultimate place to go and write. Uh, has that come to fruition yet? Uh, do you know when it will? And also, what inspired that? I mean, it, it, it's uh, for someone who I, I assume is, you know, likes his privacy, it, it just seems like an interesting idea. Yeah, the house in Bangor became a place that they stayed less and less frequently. Um, he has a house in Western Maine where he spends the summers primarily. He has a house in Florida where they winter. And so you're right, the, the, the uh, West Broadway house has really become a, a tourist attraction. Um, people aren't, you know, you can't get on the grounds or you shouldn't, even if the gate happens to be left open, you know, people tend to be pretty respectful and just hang around outside the, the gates and that. But uh, I think it was a twofold thing. Um, his literary archives until uh, recently were housed at the University of Maine in, in Orono, Maine. And the combination idea came up that he would take the archives out of the university and recreate his archives in at least one building on that plot of land. I think there are, there are multiple buildings. And then use the house or some fraction of it as a writer's retreat. And th that plan really got going just before the pandemic started. So that really put the brakes on a lot of the development of it. So I haven't heard um, about the writer's retreat idea when that's going to kick in. Um, I, during the process of working on the new book, I was in touch with uh, one of his assistants who's in charge of the archives as they are now in the house um, so that we could get some documents. And it seems that they probably digitized a lot of the material. So when I made some requests for certain uh, documents, they were able to turn them around and send me PDFs almost uh, like from one day to the next. So I think that a lot of that work is what's been going on is to digitize it, to make it more available to people who can't necessarily get to Bangor. Yeah, uh, that's, yeah, it'd be very interesting to see. And do they happen to reveal the cost of that writer's retreat or no? I don't know that there will be a cost involved. I think there will be an application process uh, oh. But, you know, you'll have to, you know, t tell why you think you deserve to be there. And uh, I mean, I, 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 I may be wrong. You, you, there'll probably be room and board or you may have to fend for yourself outside of the, the house for your uh, meals and entertainment. But uh, I don't know that. But uh, if there is a, a cost to it, I would expect that that money would go to uh, one of their charity uh, funds or something like that. But again, that's just speculation. Yeah, that's, it's, it's, I think it's awesome. So I'm very much looking forward to seeing how that all plays out. So when it came to writing this book, um, how did you figure, I mean, knowing that you've written about Stephen King before and that you're looking at, and that he's continuing to create, how did you tackle this book? Because um, I'm currently writing a book about you know, the history of an organization, but you're writing about the history of someone everybody knows. And there's so much, like when some people think of Stephen King, they think of it. Other people think of Carrie. Other people think of the Dark Tower series. Um, you know, so how do you structure a book like this to capture everything and also appeal to all audiences, you know, regardless of when they became a Stephen King fan? So that was my, uh, my plan was to capture everything um, because I had to pick and choose on the previous book that I'd done. And there were certain books that didn't even get mentioned 
big chunks of time that didn't even get mentioned. And I thought, okay, I'm going to go back to the beginning and I'm going to talk about every book, not all at the same depth, but there'll be something in there about every book. And I have a, a large digital archive of my own, which consists of every interview that I'm aware of that he's given in print, especially over the years. There are two or three books uh, that collected a lot of his early, earliest interviews, which is quite a, a good resource. Um, Douglas Winter wrote uh, an amazing, he was the first one to actually write a book about King's work in the 1980s called The Art of Darkness. And of course, since it's, you know, 40 years ago now, almost it's uh, out of date, but he had such great access to King at the time that it's, it remains one of my favorite uh, go-tos for the early stuff. And so my idea was, so the, the book's subtitle is His Work, His Life, and His Influences. And for me, that's the proper order because I'm mostly interested in his work and I'm only interested in his life to the extent that there's something in his life that inspired or was going on when he worked on something. There's a lot of biography that I don't cover. There's, you know, just sort of the mundane, trivial things that have no relationship to what he was working on. That, that stuff doesn't interest me, but I really am interested in the creative inspiration for his books and especially what he said about them in his own words at the time that he was working on them or at the time when the books were published. So the book is packed full of quotes. King quotes, 99% of them, mostly taken from the time when he was working on these things to illustrate where his mind was, what was the trigger, what was the spark that got him going on this project and how that developed. and one of the really interesting things I discovered is sometimes that spark either didn't make it into the book at all. It, it was really, it got set him on fire, but then the whole idea changed. Or it's such a subtle inspiration. And the one that I've, I've mentioned, uh, Billy Summers, uh, which is one of his more recent books. The picture that came to his mind first that I got him going was somebody in a basement apartment looking out through the windows that are at street level, seeing feet go by. And so that got him thinking, why is he in this circumstance? And then that cascaded into this long mystery book about a, a, a hitman for hire who ends up hiding out eventually in this place. But it's, it's, you know, you wouldn't look at that scene and say, oh, of course, that's how we got the idea for the story about the hitman. And those types of vignettes the, those looks at yeah i mean inspiration I mean, he's always been interested in where stories come from and a lot of his books have sort of grappled with the creation myth uh lisi's story um the famous writer who dies had this secret other world that he went to where there was the myth pool the story pool he'd, he'd go there and he would draw stories from that pool and that would be what fed him creatively um in fairy tale his the king's most recent book there's this theory that there are multiple worlds and the stories that our creative people in this world write are because their creative energy allows them to maybe glimpse what's going on in these worlds next door and derive their stories from that so in fairy tale, this boy goes on this adventure into this fairy tale land and he encounters a, a, a merry-go-round where if you put something on it and run it the right direction, it gets younger. And he said, well, you know, Ray Bradbury wrote about that and something wicked this way comes. Maybe Ray Bradbury, when he was sitting as typewriter, was channeling this other world. And there's multiple other instances of that. And so, yeah, I mean, where do stories come from? When we sit down and put our hands on the keyboard or we get our pen in our hand, how does that work? And I think it's a mystery to most of us. Um, and, you know, sometimes you, you worry if you look at it too deeply, you might break the magic. But King has really done a lot of deep thinking about where the stories come from. Yeah, and you mentioned uh, fairy tale. I am currently listening to it, and it's wonderful. And Stephen King actually lends his voice to the book, um, which is interesting. And as I was listening to it, I was like, I don't know why, 
but this kind of reminds me a little of Never Ending Story. And then as I'm listening to it, they literally mention Never Ending Story. And I'm like, how about that? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I and, that he's and so many other of, things too. The Wizard of Oz, I mean, all of the all of the Grimm's fairy tales. I mean, he's sort of saying these things really happen somewhere. And we tell the stories about them as if there are myths and legends, but there's a place where these things really happened. Yeah, it's, I love that. Uh, I think it's really great uh, uh, that he, you know, he really looks at a, at a very deep level. Uh, you mentioned Douglas Winter, which is interesting because I mentioned, we, and we kicked off this conversation where I mentioned Clyde Barker. And it's uh, Clyde Barker and Stephen King, there's a certain, some parallels, right? I mean, Stephen King is, has that quote about Clyde Barker's The Future of Horror. Uh, so he's obviously a fan of his writing and his work. Uh, they literally are like born around the same time. And uh, Douglas Winter wrote biographies, uh, authorized biographies of both writers. Um, what do you think the, the, I'm not sure if you're a fan of Clyde Barker, but uh, you know, what are your thoughts on Clyde and kind of how he, there are like these little bit of like overlap or connections between him and Stephen King? I mean, I think Clive Barker approaches horror quite differently than King does. I, mean, I, I read the Books of Blood when they came out here in paperback uh, back in the day, many years ago. I've read many of his novels, um, seen movies, uh, you know, adaptations of some of his works. I, they're playing in the same playground, but they're going about it in a different way. And I would extend that to say that I think Peter Straub also, you know, they're playing in that playground, but they just have different literary interests, different storytelling interests, dipping into different myth pools, perhaps. Um, you know, the things that inspire one are not necessarily the same as what inspires another, or if they were looking at the same pool, they would come up with something completely different uh, in terms of what the story became. Um, I mean, Clive Barker is clearly a powerhouse writer. He's, you know, he, he's written some amazingly intricate, uh, you know, complex novels. To me, they're not as accessible. Um, I, I, mean, I, I find King's writing is more accessible. Peter Straub, I, I would say, is sort of halfway in between. Some of his early books are uh, very gothic, very intricate. Um, he reinvented himself two or three times during his uh, his writing career to sort of streamline, make things a little bit more accessible, make them, make his books shorter. And I think sometimes there's a conscious effort on the part of the writer to say, well, this is this is the audience I want to address. This is how I want to address them. And, and I think that's unique and different to all of those different writers. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so you mentioned Stephen King and the accident. Uh, tell me about that. You know, um, for those that don't know, because maybe there's people watching this who are just super casual Stephen King fans. What is the accident and uh, how did you address it in your book and how do you think it influenced uh, Stephen King um, as a person and as a writer? So, so the, the way the book is broken up, it, I, as I was trying to sort of assemble a, an outline to it, I said, well, you know, the decades really do signify different writing time periods in his life. So there's the early works in, that he published in the 70s. Everybody knows Carrie Salem's Lot, The Shining, The Stand. And then there's the 80s where the stuff he did in the 70s catapulted him onto this big stage. Everybody's reading Stephen King. Everybody's adapting Stephen King. Everything that he writes is a bestseller. And then at the end of the 80s, there's, he goes through his rehab period, you know, when he kicks alcohol and drugs and things that he writes in the 90s are different in a lot of ways. Uh, the, the three of the earliest books he wrote in the 90s were uh, novels told from the perspective of a female character. So Dolores Claiborne, Gerald's Game, Rose Matter. And then he switched publishers at the, uh, toward the end of the 90s. Uh, to go to Scribner, which was a more literary publishing house in general than Viking had been. And so what he was starting to work on then were things like Bag of Bones and Hearts in Atlantis, which suddenly put him on a different level. People 
literary critics especially started taking him more seriously as a writer rather than just a you know a bestseller of you know scary stories but then at the very end of that decade in june of 1999 he's out for a walk one day and he, he's always been a great walker and this guy driving a van's not paying attention and he veers off the road and he runs into king and really really badly injures him and then one of the descriptions he says that is the doctor said his leg was just like a bag full of marbles that's how badly his leg was shattered he had uh you know broken lung uh, uh, broken ribs uh, all sorts it, it, it took him a long time to get back uh, on track again and as somebody who was a recovering addict having to deal with opioid medications for the pain he knew he was at risk of relapsing again so that was you know something else that was on his mind there was a period where he wasn't sure he'd ever be able to write again and then the 2000s come along and he does start writing again he writes Dreamcatcher. He writes on writing, which he'd been working on just before the accident. And But so much of what he writes, even to this day, is influenced by that accident. In Dreamcatcher, one of the main characters is a guy who's hit by a car, and he's, you know, he has these four, four, three friends that he goes off hunting with, and he's just recovered enough to go off on this one. All the way up to Fairy Tale, where we have Mr. Bowditch who falls off a ladder and shatters his leg and ends up with an external fixator, just like King had, and is uh, worried about, you know, they're parceling out his opioids so that he doesn't get an addiction problem. But uh, from a Buick 8, um, there's a person killed by, you know, hit by a car in the early pages of it. Um, Duma Key, there's a, a, the main character is somebody who's injured in an industrial accident and has memory issues. And the Dark Tower series, King writes himself in, and the date of his accident, June 19th, 1999, becomes a significant incident in that novel uh, because King is the creator of the world of the Dark Tower. And if he doesn't survive that accident, then the story doesn't end. And so it's really one of the most uh, critical things that happens happened in his life as inspiration for his work. And it also extends into books like Lisi's story because he had a, a, a lung puncture that hadn't healed correctly. And he got a very serious case of pneumonia, which put him back in the hospital again. Almost died from that as well. And that um, experience led to the novel Lisi's story, which is about the famous author who dies and leaves behind his wife to look after his works as we discussed earlier uh, so when it came to this book did you do a new interview with Stephen King uh, for the purposes of putting this together or did he just say to you hey if you need anything clarification anything just let me know uh, I'm just curious about that uh, any contributions he made aside from obviously the archive to yeah, the, yeah, the archives uh, was the limit, the, the limit of it I didn't interview him about it I didn't really communicate with him about it uh, the publisher um, prim primarily dealt with the archives. You know, we wanted to do things officially to get things, you know, handled properly. The the extent of his um, participation in the project is he tweeted about it the week before it was published, and which of course puts it on a whole different level of visibility, and. Um, I'm a member of, like you said, the International Thriller Writers. Uh, I'm a member as well. And one of their, their big projects is this monthly newsletter called The Big Thrill, in which they focus on every author who's a member of the org who has something new coming out that month. And so I was contacted, after, you know, I submitted the book and they said, you know, definitely we're going to cover it. But we had this idea. You know, we featured the book that somebody had written about Lee Child. And for that one, we got Lee Child who interviewed the person who wrote the book. I said, how about having Stephen King interview you? And so I'm sitting there thinking, mm, that's, that's, a, that's sort of a big ask because I know, you know how busy a guy he is. And I've interviewed him a couple of times in the past, but mostly we don't deal with business stuff in our you know, email relationship. We're just talking about family shit stuff and interests. But so I, I asked him, uh, if, he, if he would interview me, and he agreed. 
And so we ended up having the cover story in the big thrill where uh, Stephen King interviewed me and that was wildly popular. Uh, you know, it generated a lot of interest in the book. That's literally why we're talking right now. Cause I <laughs> read that interview and I'm like, what, this book sounds interesting. And then I reached out and um, here we are. So yeah, it, it worked. Uh, and so it how worked. did that interview take place? Was that by email over the phone or how'd you guys uh, do that? By, by email. Um, the, the only time I've interviewed him twice by phone, I interviewed him for the Dark Tower Companion. Um, and then we did an interview of each other for the audio version of Flight or Fright, um, which was fun. You know, we, we sort of worked our way through that project, but we were on the phone for that one. But yeah, this one was completely by email. Interesting. Um, and so has, I assume he has a copy of the book. Did he give you any feedback on, hey, you know, it's great or anything like that? I'm still waiting on my author copies. I'm supposed to get them tomorrow. And uh, so he's, he's, he's number one on my list to send one to. Um, two weeks ago, he sent me a copy of uh, a fairy tale. And so, I, you know, I was a little bit debating with myself, you know, do I send him a copy of this book? You know, it's, you know, how, how uncomfortable does it make somebody to get a copy of a book that's written about yourself or about your work? But uh, since he shared his with me, I feel obliged to return the uh, return the effort. And uh, I've got a couple of other little things I want to send to him too. Um, Brian Freeman, who used to be a cemetery dance, uh, now has his own press called Vivian Publications. And he uh, asked me to write an essay that he gave to his Patreon uh, members. And it's uh, King's books that had different working titles and why the titles got changed. And so we came up yeah. with this cool little chapbook called What's in a Name? And we had a, a, an illustrator come up with fake book covers for all of these uh, 12 or 13 books that had different working titles. Like, you know, Rage was getting it on and Salem's Lot was second coming. And so we had, we had some fun with all of that. And uh, so I have to send him a copy of that too. That's great. I mean, you said Brian Freeman. Is this the same Brian Freeman who wrote Immoral and other books? There are two Brian Freemans. Uh, he, when, when Brian... Freeman from Cemetery Dance publishes, he publishes as Brian James Freeman. Oh, okay. So it's probably a different Brian Freeman. Yeah. Um, so Stephen King, you're mentioning about how he became kind of more literary uh, later on. Uh, do you think he's an author who cares about critics or their opinion of his work? Does he want to be accepted by that community or is he just, you know, driven by the story and by what his fans enjoy? I think you have to care. I think any writer cares. Um, one of the things that inspired him to write um, on writing was a conversation he had with Amy Tan. Um, they were together as part of the Rock Bottom Remainders. Uh, I don't want to call them a rock band. They were uh, a, a bunch of writers playing musical instruments, let's put it that way. And the dialogue that came up, I think Amy Tan says, you know, they never ask writers like us about the language. They just ask about stories and characters and they don't really think that we're that interested in you know, the words, the structure, the how the whole thing is put together. And I think that triggered something in King to say, you know, I want to talk about how writing, what writing means to me. And it's more than just storytelling. There is an art to it. And uh, yeah, I mean, he had his, uh, in, in, in my book, I've got this little brouhaha he had with Carol Bloom, who objected greatly to King getting the National Book uh, Association, you know, Medal of Honor. But uh, the day King was presented with that medal, he, that was the incident where his pneumonia had kicked in. And he was really, really sick. And the doctors recommended that he not go to that ceremony. But it meant so much to him that he went, he gave his speech. In his speech, he talked about other writers that, because the National Book Association tends to be a little bit highbrow literary, you know, uh, he talked about people like Peter Straub and Jack Ketchum. He said, uh, Elmore Leonard, you know, you, he said, you don't get brownie points for ignoring these people. These are people you should be reading as well. And he gave his talk and was immediately whisked away to the hospital straight from that speech and spent like six or nine weeks in the hospital thereafter. But it meant that much to him uh, to be given that acknowledgement that uh, 
and then you know obama has given him the the american the medal uh, medal of freedom whatever it's called he's getting another one this month uh, from the, the the times of london i think those things matter um when you ask him about legacy he you know he sort of equivocates on it and says well you know i'll be dead so you know who, who cares but he, he does look at some of his books and say you know i think when i'm gone the this book or that book might be something that people will still read in the future he said in the same way that people are reading dracula and frankenstein they'll probably still be reading the shining for example things like that so i, I think he must give it some thought yeah, I was at the National Book Awards when James Patterson got the medal and Stephen King uh, famously, and James Patterson says this regularly, he's like, oh, Stephen King thinks I'm a terrible writer. And I, I, I forget what Stephen King specifically said about James Patterson as a writer, but yeah, I think he didn't say anything favorable. He said something kind of dismissive. Uh, but it's funny because they're both kind of similar in that respect where they're like really popular writers both got this award and now when you read james patterson's bio they lead with the award yeah. so clearly he cared yeah. the same way stephen king cared um so what are your thoughts on why stephen king probably doesn't like james patterson as a writer uh you know is there any sort of a beef there like what's that all about and uh, any parallels you see between the two i think that it's all high drama all done in good fun um there's there's a similar thing between king and kuntz who uh, often share a shelf in the bookstore. And uh, you know, there's some, uh, there was a cartoon, I don't know if it was Family Guy or The Simpsons once, about uh, King's accident. And somebody said, oh, it was uh, Kuntz that got run over. You know, it wasn't that bad of an accident. And I think they just play it for laughs. Um, you know, there, are all, there have always been, through history, there have been uh, literary feuds. Uh, famous writers who just snipe at each other all the time and you've got to believe that to some extent they're doing it for fun and a little bit for publicity um, I don't think that they've got anything against each other personally or professionally it's just let's 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 have some fun with this yeah absolutely you know um, yeah and James Patterson just uh it, what he's accomplished in such a relatively short period of time is just astonishing. Um, I mean, he just revolutionized the industry, frankly. Uh, but uh, so you mentioned Stephen King's sons earlier. So Joe Hill, he obviously doesn't have King in his name. Uh, you know, what, I assume that was intentional. And, yes. and, and he absolutely looks like Stephen King when you see him. <laughs> uh, so what do you think about that? You have like these two sons who are following in the footsteps of like like i said one of the greatest writers of all time that's a hell of a thing to do uh, and i guess what are your thoughts on kind of their journey how they're going about it again the whole name thing and then also working with dad and mm -hmm. maybe Stephen king's thoughts on them and you know what they've accomplished so so joe i i met joe uh, when my wife and i visited the house in 97 he was uh, still in university at the time i think and he he wanted to succeed on his own merits. He didn't want people to publish him when he wasn't ready, just because of who he was. Uh, he saw that it would be too easy for somebody to say, oh, here's a book by Stephen King's son, uh, maybe before Joe was ready to be published as a novelist. And he would be the first to admit that he's got at least two or three trunk novels that you know, he subbed around and weren't accepted and probably rightfully so. His breakthrough was a, a short story collection, uh, 20th Century Ghosts, which was published by a small press uh, in England, PS Publishing. And very, very few people knew at the time who the author was. It came as Joe Hill. And um, it was sometime after that before people... Because even at that stage, you know, he wasn't that visibly known. So people couldn't comment on the physical similarity between the two of them at their ages. But eventually, you know, the, the story broke about who he was. Um, and I think that probably changed his trajectory a little bit. But by then he'd established himself in 20th Century Ghosts is one of the best single author short story collections I have ever read. 
Uh, I say that without any hesitation. There are just so many remarkable and different stories in that collection um, that I, mean, I often recommend it to people just because if you're wanting to, it, to me, it's it's like it's like King's Night Shift. Um, King's Night Shift was really my inspiration to write fiction. And I wanted to write stories like that. And I wish I could write stories like Joe Hill does. The, the one that Joe wrote for Flight or Fright, uh, I was just so taken by it when he sent me the first draft because it takes place on an airplane um, that's in the air while World War III begins. And so we've got these characters and it's it's sort of like a, a two-hander, they call it. So there's there's you've got pairs of people who we see for, through their eyes, the other character, and then the camera rotates 180 degrees and you see the opposite direction. And there's four different sets like that. Uh, just the skill to create that way of telling a story. I, I, I wanted to imitate it immediately. Uh, it was just so astonishing to me. Owen went a little bit of a different route because Joe was clearly playing in King's sandbox. He was writing primarily horror, where Owen doesn't. Owen was writing literary fiction. Um, and so he started off publishing you know, short stories. Um, he has a, started off with a collection. He's done a couple of novels, but they're vastly different um, than anything that his father has written. Although they did collaborate together on the novel Sleeping Beauties, which must have been an interesting experience for them just because they're such different writers. I would say Owen probably owes more to his mother for his creative style than he does his father. But obviously they're both fantastic writers, but very different. You know, they've evolved down different paths. Yeah, and, and what, are your, what do you think uh, Stephen's thoughts are on his sons and how they are kind of taking their, uh, you know, while they might borrow from him or his, his wife, you know, their, their style, what they've been able to accomplish, uh, you know, on their own? Yeah, I mean, storytelling has always been part of their life. You know, in the archives, there are some unpublished things where Steve and a very young Joe collaborated on a short story. Um, they've done that a couple of times since Steve and Joe have done uh, two or three collaborative works. Um, they, they did uh, uh, a novella called Thrust, which is the sort of a modern retelling of uh, a Matheson story. Um, and then they did uh, one that was uh, serialized in two parts in Esquire, which recently became a movie on, on Netflix. So they have worked together. I think they read each other uh, during the the development process uh, of their books. Um, he, I mean, he's a proud father. He, he's immensely supportive of their work. Um, I don't know that there's anything more to it than that. Uh, who wouldn't be proud to see the, your sons uh, develop their own voices and their own careers? And... Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, very uh, impressive and inspiring to say. And as we're recording this, it's October, right? So uh, Halloween is quickly coming. And uh, just want to get your thoughts on Creep Show. So Creep Show is an interesting um, yeah. collaboration between George Romero and Stephen King. And Creep Show still lives now, right? I mean, there oh. were sequels, and now there's on Shudder, the Creep Show TV show continues and is very popular. Um, and and Stephen King was in Creep Show. So, I mean, what are your thoughts on uh, Creep Show? And just kind of that unique collaboration between him, George Romero, and just kind of that legacy and how it's still, you know, alive today. And the, the next incarnation of it's going to be, they just announced they're going to be making a video game, uh, a serialized video game from Creepshow. Creepshow was the first video I ever rented in 1983 three or four when VHS was just becoming available and you could buy a, a VCR for a thousand dollars. I mean, they were really expensive. So it was a big investment, but I grew up in a small community and we only had one TV station and one movie theater. And so there were a lot of things in the late seventies, early eighties that I had never seen. And when video first came off, I was like, I got to see Creepshow. Uh, that, that was one of the very, very first things I ever rented. Um, it developed because King and Romero had just, well, they met each other probably for the first time 
there's a famous Dick Cavett interview, uh, which you can find on YouTube, and it's got um, uh, Ira Levin and Peter Straub and Romero and King just sitting around smoking cigarettes and talking about horror for an hour. And uh, I mean, it's, it's fantastic sort of flashback at that part of their lives. And they decided they were going to work together on something, and they originally thought that they were going to do The Stand. And, you know, they wrote scripts for it probably and got into development, but they said, we have to prove ourselves first. And to prove ourselves, let's do this anthology movie. And the way it ended up was a little bit different than the way they originally conceived of it, but ultimately it ended up to be these five unrelated stories, essentially, that are tied together by this comic book format um, with Bernie Wrightson um, doing the comic book art. And not only is Steven in it, his son Joe is in it as well. Joe is the little boy with the dolls, with the pin cushions, doing the voodoo stuff in the wraparound story. Um, Steve would never admit to being a um, skilled actor. Um, I think he found his profession, um, but you know they found a character for him that was within his range. Um, he, he did a similar character when uh, they did the remake of the, or when they did the Stand miniseries. He did Tom Cullen, who was sort of a slow guy. And, and, you know, he's cameoed in lots of things over the years, but uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a phantasmagorical movie. It's got these bright, vivid colors that just flash in your face over everything. It's campy. It's, it's sort of like the old Batman TV series with, you know, the, the rays of energy shooting out to demonstrate things. But on the other hand, it is really scary. It is, I mean, who doesn't remember the creature in the crate under the stairs? Um, and certainly anybody who's got any queasiness about insects, the, the last installment will uh, make you just cringe because of all of those cockroaches that they had for it. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the sequels to it have been, in the movie realm, less successful, I think, in part because King was less involved and Romero was less engaged. Um, and they started using material that wasn't things that King had written. Um, the third adaptation is, to my mind, unwatchable. It's really, it's really bad. It's mostly animated, and it's. Um, I haven't had the opportunity to see very many of the uh, the new Shutter series. Uh, I've seen one or two parts of it, but yeah, I mean, it's it's such a. I mean, everybody loved the comics. Everybody loved the old DC comics, um, especially my generation of people who cut their teeth on those things. And so to see people recreate that style. Uh, in in motion, I think is it's a lot of fun. Yeah, and Stephen King's been pretty lucky with adaptation of his work uh, to film, whether it be for TV or um, you know the big screen. Uh, there have been many great movies that have been made uh, of his work. Uh, and what are your thoughts overall on how his work is translated to the screen? I mean, because he writes long books for the most part, you know, very long books, and that's can be a big challenge to try and capture um, everything from those stories for the big screen. I think the, um, the advent of serialized uh, streaming adaptations has been great for his work because as you said, you know, it's, it's, hard, it's really hard to condense 1100 pages into a you know, 90 minute or a hundred minute uh, movie. Um, and there have been some really, really well done streaming adaptations. Uh, I'll, I'll mention 112263, which again is a really long novel, but Hulu did that extremely well. Uh, Lisi's story on Apple TV is one of the most luxurious looking pieces of television art that I've ever seen. Um, they did some really great work with the Mr. Mercedes series, which sort of flew under the radar at the beginning because it was released on the AT&T uh, uh, channel that not many people got but now it's on peacock so it's getting a wider audience but i think the double-edged sword is success breeds excess and it happened in the 1980s when you start off with some really great adaptations um you've got uh, the salem's lot on television the shining say whatever you will about it as an adaptation it's a classic universally acknowledged classic movie there were some really good 
films made and then everybody just started piling in and you started to see the quality go down to the extent where we've got like 17 children of the corn movies and and i think in the modern era um the unforeseen and success of it part one which broke so many records made so much money that everybody said oh hey you can make a lot of money off a of stephen king adaptation again and then we start seeing things like pet cemetery which i didn't think was very well done um the firestarter uh remake which i didn't even bother watching um so there's a there's a danger when things do so well but fortunately the streaming stuff has continued to be i would say uniformly high quality and just this week we're going to get to see a, a netflix movie the adaptation of mr harrigan's phone um one of the uh one of the novellas from if it bleeds which has donald sutherland in it and um jaden uh from the uh from the it movie um and it looks like it's going to be very faithful to the, the novel and i'm really looking forward to it i'm not sure what happened to salem's lot we were supposed to be seeing that around this time too um it got bumped into early next year and then it got bumped into oblivion um I think Salem's Lot is a novel that's really ripe for a, a theatrical version. Um, the, the previous two adaptations were two night limited series, um, both very much of their era. Uh, in 1979, Salem's Lot was really good, but I find it hard to go back and look at it now. So I was really looking forward to seeing what somebody would do in 2022 with Salem's Lot. Um, I, I've heard that they're doing reshoots and you know that the project has you know they've done test screenings so maybe we'll see it next year um but we'll see you know things have dried up a little bit there are a lot of projects that were announced um that never get beyond the announcement you know we've attached a screenwriter we've got a director and then radio silence for a long time um we have the boogeyman uh, which i think is coming out next year um there was a picture of a the writer's room for the prequel to it called welcome to dairy but i haven't heard anything about forward motion on that one um dr sleep which i thought was a really really good adaptation um didn't do well financially and so that sort of scuttled some enthusiasm for uh, theatrical releases at least so yeah, it's one of these things that, you know, there's ebbs and flows and ups and downs and there's been some really good adaptations and there's been some real stinkers too. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, actually I really enjoyed Dr. Sleep and I haven't read the book, but I thought the movie was excellent and, you know, eventually I want to read all of his work. Um, one that's kind of a guilty pleasure, I suppose, for me uh, is I remember in 1995, I bought a VHS tape of Wes Craven's New Nightmare. And on that tape, there were two trailers in addition to obviously the film. One was for John Carpenter's In the Mouth of Madness, which I always like when someone's like trapped in a story type of situation. And uh, two was The Mangler, which oh. was Toby <laughs> Hooper. Uh, so you had Robert England, Freddy Krueger, uh, in a Toby Hooper movie uh -huh. about a short story about Stephen King, or a short story that Stephen King wrote. And interestingly, I think they filmed it in... Australia, because in his Washington special feature, Robert England pointed out how everyone had an accent and they'd do some overdubbing and things like that. And when I watched it back, I'm like, oh my God, I never noticed that. And it was just fascinating to, to pick up on these things. Uh, what are your thoughts on The Mangler? You know, to be honest, I've never seen it. Um, a lot of the movies that were based on short stories that were taken to feature length, I didn't have so much interest in them. Uh, I don't know. And, I guess I had my early 80s fix of horror movies. A lot of it was um, curated by Stephen King in the form of the list that he had at the back of Dallas Macabre. He has the like 100 books you should read and the 100 movies you should watch. So when I was in college, a friend and I, every Friday we'd go, we'd hit the video store and we watched all these horror movies that I'd never seen up to, you know, Dawn of the Dead and... Uh, yeah, just we and I, I think I sort of got burned out a little bit on sort of like in your face horror movies. 
Uh, yeah, so I've, I haven't seen Mangler. I might have seen one Children of the Corn movie. Um, but there's some interesting work being done um, with the Dollar Baby adaptations, you know, these amateur productions. And they, they just had a film festival that was streamed uh, online. They did it last year and they did it again this year. Um, there's this guy I met up in British Columbia who did a fantastic hour-long adaptation of the doctor's case and it's just a beautiful looking movie it's a Sherlock Holmes story and so they've got all of the period costumes the period settings and uh, they got a couple of good um, name actors to star in the wraparound so Denise Crosby uh, from uh, Star Trek Next Generation and the smoking man uh, I can never remember the actor's name but from the X-Files um, and it's it's just a class piece of work uh, and with the availability of, you know, everybody with a cell phone nowadays can shoot video and anybody with a laptop can edit it. Um, they're doing some really interesting work. And to sort of um, contradict myself about the, the adaptation of short stories, the, um, the adaptation of Jerusalem's Lot that they did on epics called Chapel Wait, they took that story and they turned it into a 10 episode streaming series and when you go back and read the the short story and it's really a novella almost it's quite long they got a lot of stuff out of it into this series but then they sort of developed this whole other aspect to it um and i went into that with a jaundiced eye i was thinking eh, i'll watch this but um it's actually pretty darn good and uh, there's there's hopes that they're going to do a second season of it and when you write a book like this one are you comparing yourself at all to other authors? So in other words, like there's another book, uh, The Stephen King Companion, which came out several years ago, I think 2016. Are you thinking in your head, okay, what have other people written by, about Stephen King and how do I make sure I'm addressing something that hasn't already been addressed? Or do you just say, I'm gonna write what I'm trying to write and just kind of ignore everything else that's out there? Other than uh, The Art of Darkness, which I delve in frequently and deeply, um, yeah, I, I tend to ignore most. Of, I mean, I use other things as reference materials, obviously, and I go in and I find information everywhere. But for me, really, the model for this kind of book was a book called At the Foot of the Story Tree uh, by Bill Sheehan, which was about Peter Straub's work. And when that book was published, well, it must be 15 years ago now, Straub had only 10 or 12 books. And so to do a really deep dive into all of his work was a manageable. It's, it's a considerable sized book, but it, it was manageable where, you know, at, at that point in King's career, he had probably 45 books. And so it's, it's, a, it's a challenge to try to say something meaningful without turning it into, you know, volume one, volume two, the Encyclopedia Britannica, Stephen King. Um, so I, like, like I said, really my focus was on not not so much literary criticism. I did literary criticism, I would say, in The Road to the Dark Tower. Whereas this one, it's just, where did the story come from? Where does it fit into his life? How, what are, what, what are the building blocks that you could put together to say, this is King's evolution as a writer? And so what other people have written, I mean, everybody's got their take on King and sometimes they focus in on very esoteric little things. Um, you know, people have written about the musical inspiration of Stephen King, for example. Um, I wrote an essay for the Poetry Foundation on poetry in King's work. Uh, you know, he started in university writing poetry, uh, studied poetry extensively. As you read through King, you realize how much influence it has on, on his work. And even in his interviews, you see how at the drop of a hat, uh, he'll pick up a, a, a line of poetry that's just perfectly appropriate for whatever he's talking about. Um, there's a book that comes out this week that is focuses on the meals um, in, in Stephen King's book. It's a uh, Castle Rock cookbook and you know, somebody who's read extensively King's work and says, oh, in Under the Dome, they had this kind of a sandwich. And so here's a recipe for it. And uh, well, there's an interesting take uh, that would never have occurred to me, but yeah, perfectly valid. And it, it's a lovely book. And I look forward to making some of those meals. But when I was writing this book, it was really, this is me looking into where these things came from yeah and the book is beautifully designed uh you know for anyone who doesn't have a copy it's 
It's really a gorgeous book, uh, high quality, and the graphical layout just with the book covers and the photos and the archival material is just really, um, there's just a lot to enjoy. Uh, so how much input did you have when it came to, hey, here's how it should be laid out? Or did you just have an amazing uh, book designer who just did their magic and you, you looked at it and went, wow, we've got it. I would say 80% of that, um, Becker and Meyer, um, they are, they're in the industry is known as a book packager. And book packages are publishers that other publishers go to when they know a book is going to have a lot of design elements. It's going to have sidebars, it's going to have photographs, it's going to have reproductions. And so Becker and Meyer specializes in these books and they've got a whole huge catalog of these things. So I send in the text. We have material from various sources that we're going to illuminate it with. There were places where they said, we need something here. What do you suggest? And I would come up with some image for them. Um, I captioned everything, um, but the overall layout uh, was the, the the brilliance of the, the the designers and the layout people of Becker and Meyer, which is now part of the Quarto uh, group. Yeah, it's it's very impressive and definitely I highly recommend everyone who's watching this uh, buy a copy. Uh, any final thoughts when it comes to uh, this book, Stephen King, uh, his you know milestone birthday, or anything else you'd like to share? I was blown away on Friday when Entertainment Weekly decided to run a little feature on the book. I thought, wow, it's, it's the, the previous book that I had done, the Stephen King Illustrated Companion was a, Beck, uh, was a Barnes and Noble exclusive. And so people outside the country really didn't get access to it. It didn't have the visibility, whereas this book is going far and wide. Uh, people in New Zealand are getting copies of it. It's already been translated into Croatian. Uh, wow, Cro Croatian, who would guess that would be the first one? Um, Italian, Czech, uh, <laughs> Spanish are, are on the horizon, others to come hopefully. So this book has actually succeeded beyond my wildest dreams already and it's only been out for you know two or three weeks. And I'm so pleased by the, the sort of uniform response to it, which is I think what you've said. I mean, I'm as much a fan of it as anybody. It, the copy arrives and you just look at it and say, this is just a beautiful book. Um, it's, uh, and, and I'm not patting myself on the back. This is, you know, just the design stuff of it. And so, yeah, this has been uh, successful beyond my wildest dreams and I'm very pleased by it. That's fantastic. And for anyone who wants to, uh, you know, learn more about you and your books and follow along with your, you know, journey as a writer, uh, where should they go? So I have a website, obviously, bevvincent.com. Um, all of information about all my books, uh, my short story publications, I've published over 120 short stories, essays, interviews, all of that. Plus there's a message board where a bunch of us just together and talk about anything that's on our minds. Um, I have a Facebook account of, uh, Bev, at Bev Vincent on Twitter. Uh, I always provide the caveat that if you follow me on Twitter, you're going to get uh, a little bit of Stephen King stuff and you're gonna get a fair amount of my political stuff too. Um, so depending on your political leanings, you may like that or you may not, but it's, it's all part and parcel of uh, Twitter. Um, I'm on Instagram as well, although I don't use that as extensively, but Facebook is primarily, you know, friendly course with other writers and things like that. Twitter is just me letting my hair down what little of it I've got left. <laughs> That's great. And you mentioned, uh, Twitter and politics. Just real quick, I think one of the things I find most entertaining about Stephen King is his Twitter account. Uh, he does not hold back. I don't know if this if he's always been this way or if he got that way after his accident or what. But he just I love that he um, he's witty as can be, lets you know what he's thinking, uh, often entertaining, and you know, just kind of a voice of reason in this world of chaos. And uh, what do you think that's all about? Is that just Stephen King being Stephen King, or do you Pretty think much he? Something. He, he's running yeah. his own account. He's typing those with his own fingers. He also uses it to elevate other people. He brings attention to writers, to books, to TV series. And as soon as he mentions something, it all of a sudden becomes very widely known and popular. Um, there, there's, there was a Flemish TV series that he and I watched, and he just mentioned it. And all of a sudden, you know, the, the actors over in Belgium are finding out that Stephen King's talking about their work. And 
And he's always been like that. Um, he used to write a column for Entertainment Weekly, uh, every issue, and, and it was, you know, popular, you know, what, whatever's going on that's popular now. And I mean, he wrote about writers who were barely known in this country, even though they were from this country. And all of a sudden they'd get publishing deals. Um, but there was an audiobook narrator named Ron McClarty who had done a book called uh, The Memory of Running. And all of a sudden that audiobook became hugely, you know, sold extremely well. So he's always been extremely generous. Uh, on the other hand, when there are things that he sees, especially from the political side of things, he brings out the, the sharpens his knives and uh, gets into that too. There has always been this conventional wisdom that artists especially should not delve too deeply into that stuff because you run the risk of alienating um, you know, a faction of your, of your uh, readership. You know, certainly there are a lot of fans of the former president who uh, have taken him to task because of his views on the former president. But I decided for myself, you know, six years ago, I said, okay, I really am upset about a lot of things that are going on in this country. And, and this is my adopted country. You know, I'm, I'm now a citizen, but I'm originally from Canada. So, you know, I, I moved here a long time ago. I became a citizen. I take great ownership in this country and I was really angry. And so I said, I'm just going to say what's on my mind. And at that time, I had a Twitter following of maybe a thousand. And all of a sudden, I just watched it grow and grow and grow. And people who I admire started following me and, you know, magnifying what I was writing. And now I'm up, you know, in numbers, whatever numbers mean. But rather than doing me harm, it seems to have helped uh, my visibility and, uh, you know, a lot of the times you think, okay, we're talking in the echo chamber because, you know, the people who are following you are the people who agree with you and you're not really changing any minds. But I think it, it just really feels good to have a place to just talk about this stuff and get it out there. Yeah. Oh, and one more topic. Sorry. Just because you mentioned audiobooks. I have found that Stephen King's audiobooks are great. Uh, and the fact that he contributed to Fairy Tale, uh, I think, shows that he's involved with his audiobooks in a way where most authors may not be. Because some authors literally don't listen to audiobooks, have like no say in the narrator, like they're just like removed. Um, I think I, when I interviewed Lee Child, he seemed pretty removed from um, the audiobooks for, you know, Jack Reacher. Uh, not, that's not a knock, you know, of Lee Child, it's just, he just maybe just isn't that interested as other authors may be. What hooked me on Stephen King, I think, was listening to Stephen Weber narrate it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was just like, holy cow, this got me into audiobooks, got me into Stephen King, like uh, at a much deeper level, because he took something that was great and made it even greater with his performance. And Stephen Weber, for those who don't know, was also in the uh, one of the adaptations of uh, was the, the Shining, right? I think it was the, the Mick Garris version, which is for, for TV. And um, yeah, so I mean, what do you know about Stephen King's involvement with his audiobooks and just your thoughts on his audiobooks in general and how they've, you know, evolved over the years. He's, he's read many of his own books. Um, he read the original versions of the first two Dark Tower ones. He recorded them at, he has a, a radio station in Bangor and he went and recorded them there. Um, one of my favorite audiobooks that he's read is Bag of Bones, which is a first person narrative by a writer. And it just feels like Stephen King is telling me a story. It, it really has that sort of sense to it. I think there were probably lots of projects where he pro he has, you know, approval on who they get, but he has he has sort of a, uh, a stable, I guess I would call, of certain narrators who come back and have read a number of his works, and I think he he, he likes them a lot. Um, that there was the uh, there was a, a guy named Frank Muller who had done the Dark Tower oh, books, wonderful, who was badly injured in a a motorcycle accident and subsequently died from it. Um, and I think he liked Muller's a lot. And really that incident with Muller's accident uh, was the genesis of a, a foundation that King created, called, originally called the Wave Dancer Foundation and ultimately became the Haven Foundation because before the Affordable Care Act, there were a lot of creative people who were flying without a net when it came to health insurance. 
And so he created this to help support people in the arts who had some sort of catastrophic incident that was depriving them of their income or, or you know, they just needed financial help. And so uh, he had that foundation. Um, and I have to say one of my favorite audiobooks of King's, uh, which I listened to a couple of years ago, is Duma Key. And that's read by John Slattery, who was Roger on uh, Mad Men. And the, mm. the protagonist of Duma Key is a little bit of a sarcastic wise ass. And Slattery's character on Mad Men uh, was also just that. And so the mesh of that voice and that tone uh, just works so well that it's, it's a real delight to listen to. But I, I think, you know, he probably doesn't get involved in absolutely everything. Um, there are short story collections where he might read one or two of them and then other people give voice to other things. But audiobooks have always been a big part of his life. He talks in uh, on writing about how, because he used to drive a lot, because he hates to fly, um, and he'd, get his, he'd hire his kids to read books to him on tape, and he would listen to those in the car while he was driving. This was back before books on tape was a really big thing, and so there were things that it hadn't been taped that he wanted to hear, and you know, he'd, he'd pay them five or ten bucks to, to read a book, and then he'd have something. So, yeah, that's always been part of his um, reading experience as well. Uh, that's funny. Uh, Frank Mahler, I, uh, I have a copy of uh, Prince of Tides where, mm. where he narrated that and holy cow, uh, just uh, amazing. It's such a shame that he passed away. He had just this beautiful voice and just a way of really connecting with the listener. And I'm glad the audiobooks are starting to really get their uh, fair shake now with, uh, I think really podcasts kind of led to the adoption and the, the digital nature of audiobooks now and the accessibility of them. Uh, makes them much more uh, it's why they're growing by leaps and bounds um, it's hard hard work I tell you my only first-hand experience with it was I was invited by uh, Simon and Schuster to record the uh, afterward to flight or fright and so mm -hmm. I went downtown uh, there was a little house where they had a recording studio the engineer was up in uh, New York I had their uh, headphones on so I could hear them there was a recording engineer in the next room and I had six pages to read. Oh, that took 45 minutes because it was, try try that line a little bit differently or punch that word. And so it was stop and start and stop and start. And to me, it felt like by the end of it, they probably had like all these little snippets of film on the floor that they had to sort of tape together and make something out of. Um, I'm sure that professional actors uh, don't have as much of that, but certainly, the engineer and the recording engineer has a lot of input into it. And I'm sure there are lots of takes sometimes because, you know, you stumble over words or you don't get the emphasis, you know, the, the way the sentence came out is probably not the way that has the most effect. And it's it's quite a process, I think. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, I had the pleasure of interviewing Dick Hill, who did the voice of Jack Reacher for many years for the Lee Child books and a very distinct voice. and. Uh, people get so tied to a voice that to them, that's the character, right? They're like, oh, he's Jack Reacher, right? And to, they almost prefer listening to the books to reading the books because like that's just their experience that they have with it and it helps them connect. Uh, but yeah, audiobooks are fantastic. Um, so uh, anyone uh, you know, watching this, you know, go out there and get yourself some Stephen King audiobooks. Um, and uh, and you said your book with him that you you worked with him on the the that's on Audible and that includes uh, the the interview with you guys. That includes the interview. Um, King reads his um, introduction, his story, the little uh, previews in all of the short stories, and then I read the introduction to my short story and the afterward. And then there's various other people who've done all of the other stories. Awesome. Well, I'm going to check that out personally, and I encourage everyone else to do the same. Uh, excellent. Well, thank you for being so generous with your time, uh, Bev. This has really been a treat. Uh, I um, consider myself more than a casual Stephen King fan, but after reading your uh, tremendous book, I'm going to take an even, even deeper dive, because uh, I, I always find that I enjoy musicians and creative people who've been doing what they do for a very long time, because it gives you just this massive body of work to kind of sink your teeth into and see the variety of what they've done and how they've 
taken left and right turns along the way. I just think that there's something uh, you can almost like en just envelop yourself in their, their astonishing careers. And Stephen King is definitely one of those people. Thankful he's still doing what he does and providing us with great stories like fairy tale and others. And can't wait to see what the future holds, uh, both for Stephen King and you. So thank you so much for your time. This thank has you. really just been great. Appreciate it.